from around the globe, it's theCUBE. Presenting Active DQ, Intelligent Automation for Data Quality. Brought to you by IOTAHO. Okay, now we're going to look at the role automation plays in mobilizing your data on Snowflake. Let's welcome in Duncan Turnbull, who's partner sales engineer at Snowflake, and AJ Vahora is back CEO of IOTAHO. He's going to share his insight. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, David. Good to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back, AJ. Uh, and it's really good to see IO Tahoe expanding the ecosystem. So important um, now, of course, bringing Snowflake in. It looks like you're really starting to build momentum. I mean, there's progress that we've seen every month, month by month over the past 12, 14 months. Your seed investors, they got to be happy. They are, they're, they're happy and they can see that uh, we're running into a nice phase of expansion here, new customers signing up and you know, we're ready to go out and raise that next round of funding. I think, um, maybe think of us like Snowflake five years ago. So we're definitely on track with that. A um, lot of interest from investors and um, we're really now trying to focus in on those investors that can partner with us that understand AI, data and, and automation. Well, so personally, I mean, you've managed a number of early stage VC funds, I think four of them. Uh, you've taken several comp uh, software companies through many funding rounds and growth and all the way to exit. So you know how it works. You got to get product market fit. You know, you got to make sure you get your KPIs right and you got to hire yep. the right salespeople. But, but what's different this time around? Uh, well, you know, the fundamentals that you mentioned, those, those don't ever change. And um, what we can see, what I can see that's different that's shifted uh, this time around is three things. One, in that there used to be this kind of choice of do we go open source or do we go proprietary? Um, now that has turned into um, a nice hybrid model where we've really keyed into, um, you know, Red Hat doing something similar with CentOS. And the idea here is that there is a core capability, a technology that underpins um, a platform but it's the ability to then build an ecosystem around that made up of a community. And that community may include customers, uh, technology partners, other tech vendors, and enabling the platform adoption so that all of those folks in that community can build and contribute um, while still maintaining the core architecture and platform integrity uh, at the core of it. And, that's one thing that's changed. We're seeing a lot of that type of software company um, emerge into that model, which is different from five years ago. Um, and then leveraging the cloud, um, every cloud, Snowflake Cloud being one of them here, in order to make use of what customers uh, and customers in enterprise software are moving towards. Uh, every CIO is now in some configuration of a hybrid um, IT estate, whether that is cloud, multi-cloud, on-prem, that's just the reality. The, the other piece is in dealing with the CIO's legacy. So the past 15, 20 years, they have purchased many different platforms, technologies, and some of those are still established and, and still fun. So how do you um, enable that CIO to make a purchase while still preserving, and in some cases, building on and extending the, the legacy um, mature technologies that they've invested their people's time in training and uh, financial investment into. Yeah. And of course, you know, solving a problem, customer pain point uh, with technology that, uh, that never goes out of fashion. No, that, that never changes. You have to focus like a laser on that. And, and of course, um... Speaking of companies who are focused on like solving problems, Duncan Turnbull from Snowflake, you guys have really done a great job and really brilliantly addressing pain points, particularly around data warehousing, You've simplified that, you're providing this new capability around data sharing, uh, really you know, quite amazing. Um, Duncan, AJ you know, talks about data quality and customer pain points uh, in, in enterprise IT. Why has data quality been such a problem historically? Sure, so one of the biggest challenges that's really affected that in the past is that because to address everyone's need for using data, 
they've evolved all these kinds of different places to store it, all these different silos or data marts or all this kind of proliferation of places where data lives. And all of those end up with slightly different schedules for bringing data in and out. They end up with slightly different rules for transforming that data and formatting it and getting it ready and slightly different quality checks for making use of it. And this then becomes like a, a big problem in that these different teams are then going to have slightly different or even radically different <laughs> answers to the same kinds of questions, which makes it very hard for teams to work together uh, on their different data problems that exist inside the business, depending on which of these silos they end up looking at. And what you can do if you have a single kind of scalable uh, system for putting all of your data into it, you can kind of sidestep a lot of this complexity and you can address the, the data quality issues in a, in a, single, in a single way. Now, of course, we're seeing this huge trend in the market towards uh, robotic process automation, RPA. That adoption is accelerating. Uh, you see in you know, UI paths, uh, IPO, you know, 35 plus billion dollars uh, of valuation, you know, snowflake like numbers, nice comps there for sure. Uh, AJ, you've coined the phrase data RPA. What is that in simple terms? Yeah, I mean, it was born out of uh, seeing how in our ecosystem across that community, developers and customers, uh, general business users were wanting to adopt and deploy uh, to our host technology. And we could see that, um, I mean, it's not marketing RPA, we're not trying to automate that piece, but wherever there is a process that was tied into some form of a manual overhead with handovers and so on. Um, that process is something that we're able to automate with, with our entire host technology. And, and the employment of AI and machine learning technology specifically to those data processes, almost as a precursor to getting into financial automation, that, um, that's really where we're seeing the momentum pick up, especially in the last six months. And we've kept it really simple with Snowflake. We kind of stepped back and said, well, you know, the resource that uh, Snowflake can leverage here is, is the metadata. So how could we turn Snowflake into that repository of being the data catalog? And, and by the way, if you're a CIO looking to purchase a data catalog tool, stop, there's no need to. Um, working with Snowflake, we've enabled that intelligence to be gathered automatically and to be put to use within Snowflake. So reducing that manual effort and, and putting that data to work. And, um, and that's where we've you know, packaged this with our AI machine learning specific to those data tasks. And, and it made sense. That's what's resonated with, with our customers. You know, what's interesting here, just a quick aside is, you know, I've been watching mm -hmm. Snowflake now for a while. And, and you know, you, of course the, 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 the competitors come out and they'll maybe criticize, well, they don't have this feature, they don't have that feature. And, and Snowflake seems to have an answer. And, and the answer oftentimes is, well, it's the ecosystem. Ecosystem is going to bring that because we have a platform that's so easy to work with. So, the, so I'm interested, Duncan, in what kind of collaborations you are enabling with high quality data. And of course, you know, your data sharing capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think uh, you know the ability to work on on data sets isn't just limited to inside the business itself or even between different business units. We were kind of discussing maybe with those silos before. When looking at this idea of collaboration, we have these challenges where we want to be able to exploit data to the greatest degree possible, but we need to maintain the security, the safety, the privacy, and governance of that data. It could be quite valuable. It could be quite personal, depending on the application involved. One of these novel applications that we see between organizations of data sharing is this idea of data clean rooms. And these data clean rooms are safe collaborative spaces, which allow multiple companies or even divisions inside a company where they have particular uh, privacy requirements to bring two or more data sets together for analysis, but without having to actually share the whole unprotected data set with each other. And this lets you to, you know, when you do this inside Snowflake, you can collaborate using standard tool sets. You can use all of our SQL ecosystem. You can use all of the data science ecosystem that works with Snowflake. You can use all of the BI ecosystem that works with Snowflake. But you can do that in a way that keeps the confidentiality that needs to be preserved inside the data intact. And you can only really do these kinds of 
uh, collaborations, especially cross organization, but even in, inside large enterprises, when you have good reliable data to work with, otherwise your, your analysis just isn't going to really work properly. Uh, a good example of this is one of our large gaming uh, customers who's an advertiser. They were able to build targeting ads to acquire customers and measure the campaign impact and revenue, but they were able to keep their data safe and secure while doing that, while working with their advertising partners. Uh, the business impact of that was they were able to get a lift of 20 to 25% in campaign effectiveness through better targeting and actually a, a pull through into that of a reduction in customer acquisition costs because they just didn't have to spend as much on the forms of media that weren't working for them. So AJ, I wonder, I mean, you, you know, with, with the way public policy is shaping out, you know, obviously GDPR mm -hmm. started it in the states, you know, California Consumer Privacy Act, and people are sort of taking the best of those and, 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 and there's a lot of differentiation, but what are you seeing just in terms of, you know, governments really driving this, this move to privacy? Yeah, um, government, public sector, we're seeing uh, a huge wake up and activity in uh, across the whole piece there. Um, part of it has been data privacy. Um, the other part of it is being more joined up and more uh, digital rather than paper or form-based. Uh, we've all got stories of waiting in line, holding a form, taking that form to the front of the, the line and handing it over at a desk. You know, government and public sector is really looking to transform their services into being online digital self-service. Um, and that whole shift is then driving the need to um, emulate a lot of what the commercial sector is doing um, to automate their processes and to unlock the data from silos to put through into those, uh, those processes. Um, you know, another thing that I can say about this is the the need for data quality is, as uh, Duncan mentions, underpins all of these processes, government, pharmaceuticals, utilities, banking, insurance, the, the ability for a chief marketing officer to drive a, a loyalty campaign, the, the ability for a CFO to reconcile accounts at the end of the month to do a, a, a quick, accurate financial close. Um, also the, the ability of uh, customer operations to make sure that the customer has the right details about themselves in the right uh, application that they can sell serve from. All of that is underpinned by data and is effective or not based on the quality of that data. So whilst we're mobilizing data to the Snowflake cloud, the ability to then drive analytics, prediction, business processes off that cloud um, succeeds or fails on the quality of that data. I mean, and you know, I would say, I mean, it really is table stakes. If you don't trust the data, you're not going to use the data. The problem is it always takes so long to get to the data quality. There's all these endless debates about it. So we've been doing a, a fair amount of work and thinking around this idea of you know, decentralized data. Data by its very nature is decentralized, but the fault domains of traditional big data is that everything is just monolithic and the organization's monolithic, the technology's monolithic, the roles are very you know, hyper-specialized. And so you're hearing a lot more these days about this notion of a data fabric or what Jamak Dagani calls a data mesh. Uh, and we've kind of been leaning into that and, and the ability to, to connect various data capabilities, whether it's a data warehouse or a data hub or a data lake, that those assets are discoverable, they're shareable through APIs and they're governed on a federated basis. And you're using now bringing in a machine intelligence to improve data quality. You know, I, I wonder Duncan, if you could talk a little bit about Snowflake's approach to this topic. Sure, so I'd say that, you know, making use of all of your data is the, the key kind of driver behind these ideas of data meshes or data fabrics. And the idea is that you want to bring together not just your kind of strategic data, but also your legacy data and everything that you have inside the enterprise. I think I'd also like to kind of expand upon what a lot of people view as all of the data. And I think that a lot of people kind of miss that there's this whole other world of data that they could be having access to, which is things like 
data from their business partners, their customers, their suppliers, uh, and even stuff that's you know more in the public domain, whether that's you know demographic data or geographic or all these kinds of other types of, of data sources. And what I'd say to, to that to some extent is that the data cloud really facilitates the ability to share and gain access to this both kind of uh, between organizations, inside organizations, and you don't have to you know, make lots of copies of the data and kind of worry about the storage and this federated um, you know, idea of governance and all these things that's quite complex to kind of manage. This, uh, you know, the Snowflake approach really enables you to share data with your ecosystem or the world without any latency, with full control over what's shared, without having to introduce new complexities or having complex interactions with APIs or software integration. The simple approach that we provide allows a relentless focus on creating the right data product to meet the challenges facing your business today. So AJ, the key here is, to, to Duncan's talking about it, in my mind anyway, my takeaway is to mm -hmm. simplicity. If you can take the complexity out of the equation, you know, you're going to get more adoption. It really is that simple. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that whole journey, maybe five, six years ago, the adoption of data lakes was, was a stepping stone. Uh, however, the Achilles heel there was, you know, the complexity that it shifted towards consuming that data from a data lake where there were many, many sets of data um, to, to be able to curate and to, um, to consume. Uh, whereas actually, you know, the simplicity of being able to go to the data that you need to do your role, whether you're in tax compliance or in customer services is is key. And, you know, listen, for Snowflake by our Tahoe, one thing we know for sure is that our customers are super smart and they're very capable, they're, they're data savvy and they'll want to use whichever tool and embrace whichever um, cloud platform that is going to reduce the barriers to um, solving what's complex about that data, simplifying that and using um, good old fashioned SQL um, to access data and to build products from it to exploit that data. So um, simplicity is is key to it to allow people to 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 make use of that data and, and CIOs recognize that. So Duncan, the, the cloud obviously brought in this notion of DevOps um, and new methodologies and things like agile that brought that's brought in the notion of data ops, which is a very hot topic right now. Um, Basically, DevOps applies to, to data, but, but how do you, how does Snowflake think about this? How do you facilitate that methodology? Yeah, so I'd, I'd agree with you absolutely that data ops takes these ideas of agile development, of agile delivery, and of the, the kind of DevOps world that we've seen just rise and rise, and it applies them to the, the data pipeline, which is somewhere where it kind of traditionally hasn't happened. And it's the same kinds of messages as we see in the development world. It's about delivering faster development, having better repeatability, and really getting towards that dream of the data-driven enterprise, you know, where you can answer people's data questions, they can make better business decisions. And we have some really great architectural advantages that allow us to do things like allow cloning of data sets without having to copy them, allows us to do things like time travel so we can see what, what data looked like at some point in the past. And this lets you kind of set up uh, both your own kind of little data playpen as a clone without really having to copy all of that data. So it's quick and easy. And you can also, again, with our separation of storage and compute, you can provision your own virtual warehouse for dev usage. So you're not interfering with anything to do with uh, people's production usage of this data. So the, these ideas, this scalability, it just makes it easy to make changes, test them, see what the effect of those changes are. And we've actually seen this, you were talking a lot about partner ecosystems earlier. Uh, the partner ecosystem has taken these ideas that are inside Snowflake and they've extended them, they've integrated them with uh, DevOps and data ops tooling. So things like version control in Git and infrastructure automation and things like Terraform. And they've kind of built that out into more of a, a data ops product that, that you, can, you can make use of. So we can see there's a, a huge impact of, of these ideas coming into the data world. We think we're really well placed to take advantage of them. The partner ecosystem has doing, been doing a great job of doing that. And it really allows us to kind of change that operating model for data so that we don't have as much emphasis on like hierarchy and change windows and all these kinds of things that are maybe viewed as a lot fashioned. And we have kind of taking this shift from this batch data integration into, you know, streaming continuous data pipelines in the cloud. And this kind of gets you away from like a 
once a week or once a month change window if you're really unlucky to you know pushing changes uh, in a much more rapid fashion as the the needs of the business change i mean those hierarchical organizational structures uh, when we apply those to big data that what it actually creates the silos so if you're going to be a silo buster which aj i look at you guys as silo busters you've got to put data in the hands of the domain experts the business people they know what data yeah. they want. If they have to go through and beg and borrow for new data sets, et cetera. And so that's where automation becomes so key. And frankly, the technology should be an implementation detail, not the dictating factor. I, I wonder if you could comment on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, making the, the technologies more accessible to the general business users or those specialist business teams, that um, that's the key to unlocking this. And it's interesting to see as, as people move from organization to organization, where they've had those experiences operating in a hierarchical sense, they want to break free from that. And, um, or have been exposed to um, automation, continuous workflows, um, change is continuous in IT, it's continuous in business, the market's continuously changing. So having that flow across the organization of work using key components such as GitHub uh, and similar tools to drive process, Terraform to build in um, code into the process and, and automation. And with Itaho, leveraging all the metadata from across those fragmented sources is, is, is good to see how those things are coming together and watching people move from organization to organization say, hey, okay, I've got a new start. I've got my first hundred days to impress my, my new manager. Uh, what kind of an impact can I um, bring to this? And quite often we're seeing that as, you know, let me take away the good learnings from how to do it or how not to do it from my previous role. And this is an opportunity for me to, to bring in automation. And I'll give you an example, David, you know, recently started working with a, a client in financial services, who's an asset manager, uh, managing financial assets. They've grown over the course of the last 10 years through M and A and each of those acquisitions have brought with it technical debt, its own set of data, they have multiple CRM systems now, multiple databases, multiple bespoke in-house created applications. And when the new CIO came in and had a look at this, he thought, well, you know, yes, I want to mobilize my data. Yes, I need to modernize my data state because my CEO is now looking at these crypto assets that are on the horizon and the new funds that are emerging that are around digital assets and, and crypto assets. But in order to get to that, where absolutely data un underpins that and is the core asset, um, cleaning up that, that legacy situation, mobilizing the relevant data into the Snowflake Cloud platform um, is where we're giving time back. You know, that is now taking a few weeks, whereas that transition to mobilize that data start with that that new clean slate to build upon a new business as a a digital crypto asset manager as well as the the legacy traditional financial assets bonds stocks um fixed income assets you name it uh is where we're starting to see a lot of innovation now tons of innovation i love the crypto examples the nfts are exploding and you know, but let's face it, traditional banks are getting dis disrupted. Uh, and so I also love this notion of data RPA, I, especially because AJ, I've done a lot of work in the RPA space. And, and I wanna, okay. what, what I would observe is that the, the early days of RPA, I call it paving the cow path, taking existing processes, you know, applying scripts, get, letting software robots you, you know, do its thing. And that was good because it reduced you know, mundane tasks, but really where it's evolved is a much broader automation agenda. People are discovering new, new ways to, to completely transform their, their processes. And I see a, a, a similar uh, analogy for data, the data operating model. So I wonder, I wonder mm. what you think about that and how a customer really gets started bringing this to their ecosystem, their data life cycles. 
Sure. Yeah. Step, step one is, is always the same. It's figuring out for the CIO, the chief data officer, uh, what, what data do I have? And, and that's um, increasingly something that they want to automate. So we can help them there and, and do that automated data discovery, whether that is documents in the file share, uh, backup archive in a relational data store, in a mainframe, really quickly hydrating that and, and bringing that intelligence to the forefront of, of what do I have? And then it's the next step of, well, okay, now I want to continually monitor and curate that intelligence with the, the platform that I've chosen, let's say Snowflake, um, in order such that I can then build applications on top of that platform to serve my, my internal and external customer needs. And the automation around classifying data, reconciliation across different fragmented data silos, building that in those insights into Snowflake. Um, as you'll see a little later on, where we're talking about data quality, active DQ, allowing us to reconcile data from different sources, as well as look at the integrity of that data, um, to then go on to remediation. You know, I, I want to um, harness and leverage um, techniques around traditional RPA, um, but to get to that, stage I need to fix the data so remediating publishing the data in Snowflake uh, allowing analysis to be formed performed in Snowflake th those are the key steps that we see and just shrinking that timeline into weeks giving the organization that time back means they're spending more time on their customer and, and solving their customers problem which is where we want them to be well, I think this is the brilliance of Snowflake, actually, you know, Duncan. I've talked mm -hmm. to Benoit Dajavia about this and, and your, your other co-founders, and, and it's really that focus on simplicity. So, I mean, that's, you, you picked a good company to join, in my opinion. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I wonder, uh, AJ, if you could, you know, talk about some of the industry sectors that are gain, going to gain the most from, from data RPA. I mean, the traditional RPA, if I can use that term, you know, a lot of it was back office, a lot of, you know, financial. What are the practical applications where data RPA is going to impact, you know, businesses and, and the outcomes that we can expect? Yes, yeah, so, so our drive is is really to, to make that um, business general users experience of RPA simpler and, and using no code to do that. Uh, where they've also chosen Snowflake to build their, their cloud platform. They've got the combination then of using uh, relatively simple script, scripting techniques such as SQL uh, with our no-code approach. And the, the answer to your question is whichever sector is looking to mobilize their data, um, it seems like a, a cop-out. But to, to give you some specific examples, David, um, you know, in banking, where our, our customers are looking to modernize their banking systems and enable better customer experience through through applications and digital apps. That's where we're we're seeing a lot of traction uh, in this approach to to apply RPA to data. Um, healthcare, where there is a huge amount of work to do to standardize data sets across providers, payers, patients, uh, and it's an ongoing um, process there. But for retail, um, helping to to build that immersive customer experience. So recommending next best actions, um, providing an experience that is going to drive loyalty and retention. That's that's dependent on understanding what that customer's needs, intent are, being able to provide them with the content or the offer at that point in time, all, all data dependent. Utilities is another one, great overlap there with, with Snowflake, where you know, helping utilities, telecoms, energy, water providers to build services on their data. And this is where the ecosystem just continues to, to expand. If we're, if we're helping our customers turn their data into services for, for their ecosystem, that's, that's exciting. And nowhere more so exciting than insurance, which I always used to um, think back to uh, when insurance used to be very dull and mundane. Actually, that's where we're seeing 
uh, huge amounts of innovation to create new flexible products that are priced you know, to the day, to the, the situation, and, and risk models being adaptive when the data changes uh, on, on events or circumstances. So across all those sectors that they're all mobilizing their data, they're all moving in some way for, for short form to a, a multi-cloud um, setup with their IT. And I think with, with Snowflake and with our Tahoe, being able to accelerate that and uh, make that journey simple and less complex is, uh, is why we've found such a good partner here. All right, thanks for that. And, and thank you guys both. We got to leave it there. Uh, really appreciate Duncan, you coming on. And, and AJ, best of luck with the fundraising. We'll keep you posted. Thanks, David. All right, great. Okay, now let's take a look at a short video. that's going to help you understand how to reduce the steps around your data ops. Let's watch.